Atheist author. No, not atheist. What was the word you used? Inkthius. Inkthius. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, where's my glasses? Man? I can't read without those. I'm going to repeat what John did earlier on. I'm just going to read something. Um, oh, that sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> well, what I'm going to read is an extract from a short book I've been writing on the long history of God. Now, deliberately, the sources of my writing are intentionally orthodox, that is, both spiritual and academic. And for the simple reason that what I'm trying to show is even by using these orthodox histories and interpretations, the story still doesn't hang together. Now, this is on Jesus, so I'm just uh, going to talk about Jesus, obviously, today. Many people have been so high regard for Jesus, though having more modest views of his divine origins. It is, in fact, difficult to find anyone who doesn't like him. An exception to this general trend is the 20th century philosopher Bertrand Russell, whose pictures are back there, who published a useful collection of essays entitled Why I'm Not a Christian. Like most, Russell approves of Jesus' teachings even though he sees it as generic and derivative. At the same time, he mildly criticises Jesus' cruelty in infecting the Gadarene swine with demons and driving them to suicide, and also his seemingly <laughs> irrational destruction of the fig tree that refused to bear his fruit despite the fact that it was not the right time of year for figs and he could hardly blame the tree for the disease. On a more serious note, Russell takes considerable exception to Jesus' belief in hell and his readiness to cast unbelievers into it for an eternity of hellfire. Jesus repeats this injunction, se injunction several times, and it is interesting for us because eternal damnation in hell is an idea that has, has a provenance of only a handful of decades before Jesus is around spruiking it. It is believed, generally, that Jesus was born somewhere around about 4 AD in Galilee, which had been a Jewish annex for about 20, 125 years when Judah forced the native Iturians to convert to Judaism. Whether Jesus' family was from this <coughs> stock is an interesting speculation. Matthew gives him a rock-solid Jewish ancestral pedigree, but then we would expect him to. The ministry of Jesus of Nazareth occurs in an environment charged with the resentments of the poor, the disadvantaged, and all others who felt they were not getting their share of God's covenant. The resentment was aimed at the regime of what many saw as corrupt priests, absent and predatory landlords, and at a distance, the overrule by Rome and its representatives. Life for people on the ground, Jesus' preferred constituency, never became easier. The centuries of priestly prophetic assurances that if they finally let go of other gods and concentrated on Yahweh, then he would respond by fulfilling his covenant with them had turned out to be a non-core promise. <laughs> like the Essenes, Jesus was angered by laxity and corruption, and his message for, was for radical reform of the operating parameters of the Jewish religion. He wanted it returned to its basic principles of inclusiveness of the inhabitants of Judea. Ironically, in view of his later destiny, he seems less interested in, in including foreigners and even criticizes the Pharisees for their practice of missionary work abroad. Along the way, G Christians made Jesus divine and gave him a kind of equality with God by deciding to believe they were essentially the same being manifesting in different ways. Neither Jewish nor Muslim religious scholars are comfortable with or agreeable to this idea, nor are they alone. Many early Christians had a lot of trouble with it, and the resolution to make it doctrine and faith was made under considerable duress. Those who are used to viewing Jesus as God should understand that there is much in the pragmatic record to suggest that this view is inappropriate. There is first his Jewishness. <coughs> Judaic scholars are unanimous in agreeing that Jesus, a devout Jew, would have seen it as blasphemy to equate, to equate himself with Yahweh. Jesus himself said in response to being addressed as good master, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Then there is his quest for the status of Messiah. Throughout the Gospels, especially Matthew, there are constant references to Jesus fulfilling the steps of the prophecies that would herald the presence of the Messiah, none to suggest he was claiming to be God. And then there were also his own words to describe his mission, 
In response to a plea by a Canaanite woman to save her daughter from devils, Jesus replies, I have been sent only to the lost sheep of the people of Israel. The woman persists and Jesus relents and heals her daughter. The decision to deify Jesus was made at the Council of Nicaea in 325. Christianity had been the official religion of Rome and its empire for just 12 or 13 years. The movement to deify Jesus began soon after his death, but it was then perceived as idiosyncratic and not mainstream. This changed during the following centuries as artists began to depict the Christ as sharing the same divine properties as popular Roman gods. And following the acceptance of Christianity by the Emperor Constantine, some among the upper echelons of the church hierarchy felt it was appropriate to their new <coughs> status that Jesus be recognised as divine. Opposing the deification process was a charismatic preacher called Arius, who had extensive support among Christian communities. The dispute, though, was typical of the arguments that had taken place among Christian theorists for hundreds of years and left to their own devices, the various Christian leaders would no doubt have gone on, on endlessly squabbling. But the dispute reached the years of Constantine, who was busily bringing peace to his recently acquired realm, and he had little time or much patience for schisms in his chosen religion. Having suggested politely to the various parties, he wrote letters, that he saw their differences as somewhat slight, and after asking them with equal politeness to quickly settle these differences, and receiving no cooperation whatsoever, he called a special meeting to resolve the matter. The meeting was to be in Nicaea, part of Constantine's private estate in Turkey, a kind of Roman version of Camp David. <laughs> the Council of Nicaea effectively separates the amateur church from the professional one. While there had always been division and diversity in doctrinal conversation over the previous three centuries, there had not been a circuit breaker in the person of the Roman Emperor before. Whoever carried the day at Nicaea would go on to effectively control the future history of the Christian Church in the West, a church that was now ensconced legitimately in the heart of the Roman administration. Yet this outcome was far from obvious to the various representatives who gathered to resolve the issue. The Arians felt optimistic that they would prevail. The Bishop of Rome was disinclined to attend and sent two emissaries in his place. To many, it would have seemed just another gathering to, ch to chastise their opponents. If so, they reckoned without Constantine. As Constantine watched the doctrinal dispute unfold, he found the intricate exegesis and the elaborate doctrinal dissertations just so much splitting of hairs and said as much. That Constantine did not appreciate the issue in the same way everybody else did probably goes without saying. In the end, and quite casually, Constantine who had already made his own father a god, and would in due course expect to endure the same fate himself, opted for making Jesus divine. Becoming a god in those days was, after all, not a particularly big deal. It was not a decision which pleased everyone by any means, but it was the best that could be done. <coughs> <coughs> Nobody came up with a more acceptable idea, and anyway, Constantine was emperor, and a few, at least, later expressed the feeling they had felt pressured and intimidated into agreement. But it was bad news for the Jews, who for the previous six centuries had made such a good impression in the Mediterranean lands. Not only had they greatly increased the numbers of Jews through extensive conversions of pagans to Judaism, their very presence greatly enabled the Christians to gain a foothold in the region. For a while there seemed little to choose between them, and they coexisted and intermingled despite some inherent and ultimately irreconcilable differences. Making Christianity the official religion and making Jesus officially God made the Jews officially God killers and much calumny and discrimination would haunt them for the next 1600 years. It also permanently alienated the Aryans and groups like them. A decision by a council, however august, did not resolve the matter on the ground and the verbal battle continued to rage for another 70 years, finally ending in schism, with one side being declared heretic and the other becoming the formal orthodoxy of the Roman Catholic Church, the new state religion of an admittedly precarious Roman Empire. 
The Arian heresy was the first formal schism the Church had had to deal with. For 400 years, certain questions had remained open, and now they were closed. <coughs> the Arian heresy, so called by the victors in the squabble, was to last nearly three centuries beyond that time before it was finally eradicated. So what was the dispute about? In the end, it all came down to whether you believed Jesus was more man than God or more God than man. <coughs> Mostly this was not about Jesus as such, but about who and what God was. The Greek ideas of God, which the Church had embraced and propagated, manifestly precluded God sharing his actual power or being with any other entity. Theologians like Arius, who took a more hardline Platonic position, were happy enough to invest divine characteristics in Christ, but the bottom line for them was that Jesus was just that fraction more man than God. These people lost the debate as of course did those who thought the whole idea of a divine Christ possibly missed the point. The winners were those who on balance believed that Jesus Christ was of the same essence as his father Yahweh, equally man and God, and that his earthly experience, while real, was only made possible because he was ignorant of his true nature while he was living in a human form. The Nicene experience began a long time of rectification and cleansing as orthodoxy became defined and elaborated. Shortly after Nicaea, the following appeared out of Rome. Understand now by this present statute, Novatians, Valentians, Marcionites, Paulinians, and you who are called Catafrigians, with what a tissue of lies and vanities, with what destructive and venomous errors your doctrines are inextricably woven. We give you warning. Let none of you presume from this time forward to meet in congregations. To prevent this, we command that you be deprived of all the houses in which you have been accustomed to meet. And so in 325, the Catholic Church took a turn for the worse and began prescribing former colleagues and companions in arms. And that which had once been a difference of opinion became heresy, and heretics were put to death. And so it would be for the next 1,500 years or so. How all this prescribing and persecuting was rationalised against the teachings of their new God is uncertain. It seemed that few bothered to wonder what Jesus himself would have made of his church's sudden deadly alliance with the Roman state. For more than a thousand years following Nicaea, the Roman Catholic Church sought to hold all the keys to all the pathways to the divine. From the fourth century on, it defended its borders against the assaults of heresy, it prescribed as pagan the very Greek thinkers whose thought it had plundered, and in its quest for orthodoxy it declared as heretic its early theologians such as Oregon. It hunted down and persecuted deviants, and it viciously suppressed spiritual alternatives in the old naturalistic religions of Egypt and Western Europe. It burnt at the stake and stretched on the rack all manner of people but was particularly fond of burning heretics and those, mainly women, who were thought to be witches. At the same time, it became politically corrupt and steeped in money-making ventures like promises of re-entry to a heavenly Eden in exchange for gold on earth. From the time of the Council of Nicaea, we can track the history of the Church in a formal sense. Before that time, what would become orthodoxy was in free fall, or at least in a form of relatively amiable chaos. To call any of the rejected ideas heresy is to impose a hindsight judgment on what was at the time a melting pot of faith, speculation, insight, and personal prejudice. Thank you. We'd all like to hear some other chapters sometime. We've got some time for some questions now. Have you got that on the web? Sorry? Have you got that on the web? I have not. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm not no sure questions. No, I'm not sure. No, I'm not putting it on the web yet. Um, Sorry. No, uh, Nicaea. Um, you said after after the Council of Nicaea decided that Jesus was, in fact, um, God. Well, it's the Trinity. It's the subject of the Trinity. Yeah. Um, do you have anything, I mean, I know you touched on it briefly there, but what happened to some of the other people who just, who, the, the dissenters that weren't, are there remaining people who weren't um, burnt or killed or otherwise? Oh, look, I mean, I d I, as I was reading there, 
of the conversation we've been having this afternoon. I'm really skimming over the surface of it. Oh, I've got okay. a longer text. Um, the Aryan, in fact, the Aryan heresy dominates Europe for the next three or four hundred years. It's not until Rome, which is pretty much isolated actually for all that time until about the eighth or ninth century, uh, gets uh, some pretty good backing from the French and then starts to take over again. In fact, during that period of time, the, the Catholic Church is pretty compliant to the, gen to the secular authorities that are around it. It's only after <coughs> about the 8th century that it starts to get Some of the things like the Goths or you know, some of those tribes were actually Arians. They were Arians. Yeah. The people who, uh, who uh, Augustine saw you know, uh, sacking his own city and sacking Rome were all Christians, but they were, they were Arian Christians. They were the wrong type. They were the wrong type of Christians. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. Any other questions? Any question at all? <laughs> Let's no? Okay. No, that's <laughs> very good. Now, right. um, yes, well, I think we should all be welcome and uh, welcome to the Red Rider's Talk to you. And uh, it's about time we started uh, sharing it with the rest of us. So we're going to start today. <laughs>